What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Arnie's, and welcome back to our newest bonus series. I'm your host, Matt Johnson, a.k.a. a man traveling through time to avoid being choked out by Thanos again. And I'm Keith Baker, a.k.a. a time variant of Vince Vaughn from The Wedding Crashers, here to party. And I'm Austin Terry, a.k.a. a variant of Jeremy Renner, who actually made a best-selling album. Wow, it's about time. I wish real Jeremy Renner would have spoken to variant Jeremy Renner, and they could have uh, figured that out. Anyway, we hope you've all been having a great week as well as a week full of great content consumption. Since we last spoke on a bonus series, we finished Invincible, which we can't wait for season two. On top of that, my favorite show returned, Lucifer. The new season premiered on Netflix and was fantastic. So, what have you all been watching the last few weeks? Yeah, I have been going on a hardcore binge of Schitt's Creek, starring uh, Dan and Eugene Levy. Ooh, nice. I've heard about That's that a one. great show. Yeah. Very good. I don't know how I missed this one. It is so funny. As for me, I don't know if I've been watching anything new lately. Uh, oh, yeah, I did watch The Last Dance the documentary uh, about the, the 90s Bulls, Chicago mm-hmm. Bulls, with Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, and all those guys. That was interesting to watch. It was about, I think, nine or ten episodes, uh, so I highly recommend. Even if you're not into basketball, I feel like mm-hmm. anybody would probably enjoy that documentary, so go check it out. Yeah, I don't think so I've good. ever watched a second of the NBA, and I was so into that documentary. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And I took that personally. <laughs> Still my favorite quote. Uh, along with that, of course, if this is your first episode of The Arnie's, welcome. We are super happy to have you. Our main episodes come out every Tuesday. Earlier this week, we talked about another new release from The Conjuring Universe with The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It. Austin, Patrick Wilson, and Vera Farmiga are back as the Warrens, but things are a little bit different this time. Were you excited to go back to this franchise, and what should the listeners expect from that episode? Yeah, you know, I was really excited to get back into The Conjuring franchise. Um, I think, unfortunately, the best thing I can say about The Conjuring 3 is that it makes me appreciate The Conjuring 1 and 2 a little bit more. (laughs) Um, I think if I was going to give some advice to anybody who hasn't seen The Conjuring 3 yet, I would say don't expect to be scared, but go in looking for a crime thriller. Very true. Very true. Um, I definitely agree with that. As for this coming Tuesday, we are bringing back a series we started a while ago, Our Favorite Movies. In this series, we each take turns picking one of our favorite movies without input from the other hosts, revisit it, and break it down. This coming week is Keith's turn, and he has selected Hell or High Water. Keith, are you excited to revisit this, and what do you think we are going to get into with this recording? Man, yeah, I'm really excited to get into this, and I'm excited for your guys' thoughts more than mine. Yeah, I know we were texting earlier, and not, I don't think this gives anything away, but I know y'all were, hmm, maybe it would give it away if I say y'all are high or low on it, so I'm not going to say. Ooh. Let's leave it at that. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, I'm excited to hear you guys' thoughts. Yeah, Hell or High Water has been one of my favorite, you know, movies of the decade that come out. Um, I think it's a good modern day Western. It's got uh, Jeff Bridges, Chris Pine, Ben Foster, great actors in it. But yeah, I'm looking forward to breaking it down with you guys. And Keith, this was actually my first ever viewing of Hell or High Water, so I'm really excited to oh. talk about it with you guys That's soon. what I meant to ask you, Austin. Yeah, I didn't know if you had seen it before. I knew Matthew had seen it, but yeah, mm-hmm. I wasn't sure if you had. I'm excited to hear your thoughts on it. Cool. And yeah, I guess actually we could also mention here, we've only done this series one other time a few months ago. When it was my turn, we did Cloud Atlas. So if you're interested in how this series might shake out before the next episode comes out, scroll back up on your podcast feed and check that one out. And this might be a little bit of an announcement for you two, but I'm not sure if you've checked out the Arnie's schedule recently, oh. but I've made some changes and we are going to do three straight weeks of our favorite movies. So it's going to go Keith, myself, and then back to Matt, and we're going to see what we talk about. Ooh. I'm excited. Okay. I like that. I like that. So yeah, keep an eye out for when that episode drops. We have some great content out now and some more exciting stuff on the way. Please subscribe to the Arnie's wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Leave us some reviews with your thoughts, and also, of course, we want to hear from you. So send us a message on Instagram at the Arnie's or email us, thearniesmedia at gmail.com. Just let us know how you're feeling about all this great content. And now, it is finally time, my friends. It hasn't been too long, but it is already time to return to the MCU. We've had a drought of MCU movies due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I can't believe it, but the last one was Spider-Man Far From Home way back in July of 2019. After pushing their movie slate by over a year, we won't be back in theaters seeing Black Widow until next month. But luckily, their Disney Plus TV slate has been keeping us company the last six months. If you scroll back up on your podcast feed, you can check out all the reviews we did on WandaVision and The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Of course, now you got to swap that Falcon with Captain America, but we want to make sure that you're able to find him. 
After a brief hiatus, we are back with Loki. Despite the fact that the God of Mischief died in Avengers Infinity War at the hands of Thanos, they are back due to picking up the Tesseract during a detour to the 2012 Battle for New York in Avengers Endgame. It's been two years since we saw that happen, and now we finally know where Loki ended up and where their new journey will begin. So, without further ado, Austin and Keith, let me know what your general thoughts on the MCU Disney Plus TV shows have been so far, and give me your non-spoiler thoughts on the first episode of Loki. Yeah, uh, for the for the Disney Plus shows, I loved both of them. I thought WandaVision was such a fun time and so unique for Marvel. And then Falcon and Winter Soldier, I think, just had such great character arcs for both Sam and Bucky. And going into Loki, I think we were all kind of on the same page that we didn't really know what to expect. We weren't sure how this show was going to still feel relevant with this version of Loki being the 2012 Loki. And so I, th- I think we were all a little bit kind of cautiously optimistic coming into this one. Uh, for me, my thoughts on the premiere, I have a feeling on today's episode, I'm going to sound like I'm really down on it, but I, I, I really enjoyed it. I just have some little nitpicky things. Um, I think it's super fun. I think the way we're going to play with time in this show is going to be a really interesting dynamic and, and something new for the MCU. And I'm just so curious about what's going to happen to Loki, how things are going to end in this show, and just how this is going to impact the MCU phase four. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty much on the same page as you there, Austin. Yeah, I loved both Falcon and the Winter Soldier and Wanda. Yeah, I remember Wanda, the end wasn't all that great for me. That's what I'll say on that one as far as um, just summarizing that one. But the overall show is very interesting with the whole TV sitcom thing and all that. Falcon and Winter Soldier is really cool visiting Sam and uh, Bucky again and to see how they played out with this new uh, Captain America um, kind of rival-like character. And then going into Loki, as usual, went in blind, didn't read anything about it, didn't watch any trailers, didn't do anything. Went in completely blind, so I had no idea what to expect with this. I just pressed play on Disney Plus and went with it, and I have to say, I loved it. I'm pretty much 99% positive on this episode, and I have high hopes for the coming episodes to come. That's my non-spoiler thoughts. I'm really excited to dive deep with you guys on it for sure for sure yeah um kind of to echo your thoughts on the past shows i really liked them i definitely had some issues here and there i think all i could say is wandavision didn't really stick the landing whereas falcon and winter soldier had kind of a down spot for me in the middle of the show but ended pretty strong and kind of the character growth in that was just amazing and here with loki man like i've talked about already this was the show i was looking forward to the least because i just didn't really understand the concept it's like Loki had this amazing character arc all the way back in the first Thor film and then watching him go from being kind of a anti-hero to then a full-fledged villain to then still a villain that kind of his heart kind of softens based on, I think, Thor's interactions. And then by the end, when he sacrifices himself, he's just a full-fledged hero, in my opinion. I thought that was so cool. And so now with this show, it's like we're taking the villain Loki from the middle there and he's the main character. It's like, well, how's that going to be compelling? And I got to say, without spoiling anything yet, I thought they did a really great job. And my favorite part about this episode was it felt like they got the questions, like the necessary questions based on that premise out of the way real quick in the pilot. Like, I don't think we're going to be revisiting a lot of that. So I'm super excited. I loved it. I'm all in. Can't wait to see more. And yeah, I just can't wait to talk about it. Yeah, I think for me, I think the only reason it's going to sound like I'm a little bit lower than you two, and I'm really not. I I really did love this premiere. I just think they really nailed the opening. I think they really nailed the ending. It got a little bit slow in the middle for me, just because they were, uh, without spoiling anything, like kind of showing us some stuff we've already seen before. And that Mm -hmm. I just felt like was a bit of a momentum killer for the premiere. Yeah, it was a long episode. It was certainly longer than most of the Disney Plus shows have been so far. It was over 50 minutes. And Yeah, to your point, a lot of that is kind of just sitting and talking. So for some, you know, it might be a little bit slow in the middle there, but we'll see if it gets, you know, it kind of picks up the pace in the next episodes. Okay, well, Matt, I mean, I think we I think the only way we can move forward is by talking about spoilers. So should we give a little spoiler warning? Yes, Austin, I think we should. That, of course, everybody covers our non-spoiler thoughts. So if you haven't watched the pilot episode of Loki yet, this is your chance to bounce on out and go watch it. Once you've done so, come on back to this episode and listen to the rest, because now is your official spoiler warning. We're about to break everything down, no holds barred. So here we go. Are you ready? Three, two, one. All 
right, Austin, why don't you kick us off with our little spoiler section here. Let's go over the full cast and crew for Season 1, Episode 1 of Loki. The episode is titled Glorious Purpose. Yeah, so Loki is created by Michael Waldron. And uh, he's had kind of a small career, uh, but he, it seems like it's definitely going to be someone that we need to look out for in the future. He got his start while still in school, actually, working with Dan Harmon on the hit show Community. Um, he also did Harmon Quest and Rick and Morty. And then being kind of the creative force behind Loki is really his only other claim to fame so far. But going forward, it seems like he's really impressed Marvel because he also wrote the upcoming Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. And then Kevin Feige has also brought him aboard to write uh, the upcoming Star Wars film that he is working on for Disney. I didn't know this was the guy who did uh, or who helped on Rick and Morty and Community. That's pretty badass. Yeah. And then for the future, just kind of like Austin said there, I think it's worth noting just because it seems like a good sign. Obviously, I'm not going to get my hopes up too high, but I mean, the fact that he did this show and they're already bringing him in for Doctor Strange 2 and Kevin Feige's upcoming Star Wars movie, they must like what they saw. So I hope we do too. Can you imagine just being plucked out of college and being like, all right, here, you're going to work on Community with me, and then we're going to go write Loki for Disney+. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy, man. That's awesome. Good for him. So Michael Waldron created it, and then the episode is actually directed by Kate Heron. Uh, she is known for Sex Education and Daybreak, and it's also worth noting it sounds like she is going to be directing all six episodes of the first season of Loki, and this episode is also written by Michael Waldron. And our score was composed by Natalie Holt, and then for our cast, we of course have Tom Hiddleston as Loki. Owen Wilson as Agent Mobius, Gugu Mbatha Ra as Judge Ravona Renslayer, Wuni Masaku as Hunter B15, Eugene Cordero as Casey, and then Tara Strong doing the voice of Miss Minutes. So, guys, any highlights on our cast and crew this week? Oh yeah, I got some highlights. Whenever I first started this this episode, <laughs> I saw this guy with gray hair and a mustache, and I was like, I know that guy. And all of a sudden, I was like, Oh. <laughs> Fuck yeah, it's <laughs> Owen Wilson. My man, my man, he's back. <laughs> he's looking good. I kind of like him with the gray hair. I mean, this might be one of his best roles he's ever done, just from this one episode. He was great. I love that he's in this. So awesome. Can anybody deliver a line like Owen Wilson in terms of, it's just a line that shouldn't be funny at all, but he just somehow finds the comedy? Whenever he's talking to the judge and he's like, I feel like I'm always looking up at you. I, it's appreciated. I like it. I'm, I'm just <laughs> yeah. laughing when nobody else could do that. I mean, when they launched Iron Man back in 2007, did you ever think Owen Wilson was going to join the MCU? <laughs> Believe it or not, Austin, I did not, I did not think that back then. <laughs> Who would have thunk? Uh, besides Owen, I would say um, Tom Hiddleston as Loki. It's good oh, seeing yeah. him back. Yeah, I really enjoyed um, Tom Hiddleston as Tom Hiddleston when they did the D.B. Cooper flashback. Oh, that was pretty cool. I like <laughs> yeah, that. That was fun. I did like that too. Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, I'm I'm totally with Keith. I mean, those two are kind of the leads of our show kind of going forward. So I certainly like them. I like the rest of the cast too. It's just they were kind of in small roles, obviously, to give our main two the room to talk. So my main shout out is actually going to be, we don't usually do, we don't usually talk about the score for these episodes, but Natalie Holt scored, man. This was Score was great. Awesome. Yeah. So good. Gave me serious Blade Runner vibes, like the Vangelis score with that. That scene, we're going to talk about it later, but whenever it's overlooking the city and that, that music cue, ooh, I was like, this is so good. I, I loved it so much. The music was awesome. So she's my shout out. It's a fantastic tone setter. And I'm glad you called out Blade Runner because the music really sets the world for Blade Runner. And I think it's going to do the same thing here. Um, The last shout out I'll give since we've kind of covered the big ones this week is... uh. You guys know I typically kind of hate these like smaller side characters that don't feel like they have like a main purpose in the plot. But I really enjoyed Eudine Cordero as Casey and thought he was super funny this week. He was funny. Yeah, he was funny. Definitely better than Torres from Falcon and Winter Soldier. <laughs> yes. Austin's most yeah. hated character for those that don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so before we get into the roundtable, Matt, can you run down a plot summary for us? Yep. So just to remind everybody, after their escape from the 2012 Battle of New York, an alternative version of Loki uses the Tesseract to travel to the Gobi Desert, thus attracting the attention of the Time Variance Authority. Loki is being tried due to apparent crimes and deviations from the sacred timeline put in place by the legendary Timekeepers. Agent Mobius takes Loki to the Time Theater where he reviews Loki's past misdeeds and questions Loki's habit of killing and hurting people. Loki steals TVA tech but gives up, escaping upon realizing that TVA's power exceeds their own. Loki returns to the theater, witnessing a recording of what their future would have been, mainly their parents dying, proclaiming their love for Loki, including Thor, and ultimately Loki sacrificing himself for Thor, 
only for Thanos to kill them in return. Only then does Loki realize that cruelty and mischief will not lead to ascendance. They agree to work with Mobius to protect the sacred timeline, the twist of course being that the one causing all the trouble, death, and destruction is a rogue variant of Loki himself. Dun, 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 dun! Wow! <laughs> wow! <laughs> That's crazy, Loki. All right, guys, so with that, it's time for the bulk of our show. Let's get into our roundtable discussion. I'll kick us off. I just fucking love this episode. I thought it was so good. We've talked a lot when it comes to WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier, but I've always been the most critical on this series because, like I mentioned at the top, the whole regression of the Loki character was completely boring, in my opinion. How is a variant of Loki that didn't go through development in the last six years supposed to be interesting? Well, turns out they did exactly what I would have hoped for, which is they showed them everything that will happen in their future, and we get to see how that impacts them right off the bat. Some of it felt like exposition, which I think is kind of what Austin was getting at at the top. It feels a little bit slow. It's definitely a long episode. But having Owen Wilson as Mobius to play off of in this kind of weird therapy session really helped. So what did you guys think of them kind of getting all this big stuff out of the way quickly? I guess I'm a little bit conflicted on it. I was a little bit interested to see, like, because we've really only seen this mischievous Loki for two movies, and then we kind of got the good Loki for, I guess, three more movies. So we've known the good Loki a lot longer than the mischievous one. Mm-hmm. So I was a little bit interested to be like, okay, what will this be like? But at the same time, I'm glad we don't have to watch him go through the same growth that we've already seen him do in the MCU. Um, so I, I think it was really smart to get this out of the way. It's going to be interesting to see how this version of Loki kind of differs from what we've seen in the current MCU, just knowing his fate already. I wonder if he's going to try to take any steps to avoid that fate or if by the end of the show, he's going to kind of accept it and like need to be reset. Yeah. You know what this episode really reminded me of is it kind of reminded me of a little bit of Thor Ragnarok in a way. And the fact that Thor kind of got taken away from his, his normal self and kind of got stripped away from all his power and everything like that and had to go to this prison like place. Yeah. It kind of reminded me of that. Like he kind of got stripped of everything and now he's like in this weird vulnerable position and uh yeah like you said mobius is interrogating him and and kind of getting into his he, he and he can't do anything about it this time he can't get away like he always can i really like too how mobius pointed out like look loki you're always able to just cause mischief and escape and you can't do that now so you got two options i guess you can just be disintegrated or we can figure out what makes you tick and then you can kind of help me and maybe we can uh do a compromise or, or work out a deal And I kind of like that this Loki had to accept that just like right from the beginning. Yeah, for sure. I loved all that stuff. And I think it is probably worth noting that we get this amazing scene at the end that I got to say got me a little bit teary eyed. But seeing him watch both of his parents die, see his brother like accept him and say that he's always loved him essentially. And then, of course, seeing his own death, like such a great scene. And it clearly impacts him. Loki's crying. He's laughing at parts. But That doesn't mean he went through it. So there's a difference of actually going through that stuff and then just him watching it. The reason I say that is I still think Loki in the show is going to air more towards mischief as opposed to in the later MCU movies, whenever he was kind of turning a new leaf, we weren't getting as much of that. So I think even though he knows what would have happened, I think we're still going to get a very fun, different version of Loki simply because he knows what happened, but he didn't go through it. I really like too how at the beginning of this episode, when they show us the um, events from Endgame where the Avengers are uh, interfering in the 2012 timeline. I like how they kind of let us know that Loki like immediately figured out what the Avengers were doing. And then I like how whenever he's on trial, he's like, well, you got to go to the Avengers. They were the ones messing with time. It's like, that's cool that he's like that smart that he immediately knew that, okay, these guys are fucking with something here. Well, the cool, and I didn't catch it. I watched it back uh, earlier today, but he had a great little line after that, that I missed the first time. And like, it was kind of like, how'd you know that? And he said, it's hard to miss the cologne on two Tony Starks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that like, was hilarious. So that was kind of his justification. He smelled it twice and was like, I guess there must be messing with time. So that was pretty fun too. I liked that as well. And I liked how they also kind of blew past that too, in a good way. It was like, why are you mad at me? I mean, yeah, I took this thing, but they were messing with time. I mean, they were, were traveling all over the place. And they were like, well, the Avengers were supposed to do that. That was part of the timeline. What you did wasn't. And it's kind of a cop-out answer, but it still works. And I thought it was fine. Well, speaking of that, I mean, how do you guys feel like about the actual stakes of this show? Because I, I think it's always hard with beings who can control time to have events actually feel important. Because theoretically, they should just be able to reset everything if anything goes wrong. And in this episode, like you mentioned that, they do establish that what the Avengers did in Endgame was supposed to happen. So it doesn't seem like there's going to be any drastic changes to the current timeline of the MCU. 
Um, I just don't see how this show can really end up feeling like anything other than a fun sideshow by the time the credits actually roll on episode six. I think it's going to feel, yeah, I think it's going to feel like a sideshow for most of it is what I'm predicting. But I think in the end, it's going to reveal something probably pretty big. Yeah, I, I totally hear what you're saying. It's always hard stake wise whenever you have time travel and the ability to just reset things if anything goes wrong. Um, and yeah, a few episodes from now, we may still feel that way, which I hope we don't. The one thing I'm hoping for, based on what they set up, is this rogue Loki is clearly doing enough crazy stuff that Mobius and the TVA is worried. Like whenever we're first introduced to Mobius, it's like, a bunch of people got killed in the past, so this Loki is somehow jumping timelines and stuff. And then at the end, we see the evil Loki kill all these agents and I th- and like basically take that bomb that I guess is how they reset. So if this Loki is somehow killing all these agents and taking all those bombs, I guess you can't reset that Loki. So I think they did a decent enough job setting up that this is bad, and so we need some help. That being said... It's going to kind of depend like what Austin said, when the credits roll and this Loki has gone through this journey, do they just reset him? Is it he just sticks around? Will we feel like the stakes were good? That I'm not sure, but I hope so. Yeah, I guess I was just a little curious going into this one if they were going to make any tweaks to like the timeline of the MCU, uh, because with our two other Disney Plus shows, WandaVision and Falcon and Winter Soldier, both of those take place after Endgame. So those kind of felt a little bit more impactful, especially for Wanda and Falcon because where they are at the end of their shows is is way different than where they were when we knew them uh, the last time we saw them in like the cinematic Marvel movies. That brings up a good question. So so you know how we saw these timekeeper people, you know, jumping to like 1849 and 1858 and all these different years and all that kind of keeping the peace and keeping whatever they're doing. I don't don't know exactly what they were doing in all those different timelines, but uh, it seems like they were making sure that everything went according to plan. Do you think that we're going to see some some time jumps with them or maybe some not time jumps, but more uh, flashbacks to like more parts in the Avengers. But actually it's these timekeeper guys that are like in the background we never saw in the original movies. Yeah. I, I was wondering that too, Keith. And I think we're going to get maybe one or two scenes of that. I don't know how much of it we're going to get though. Cause I don't know how badly like the producers at Marvel want, want to tweak with what we've already seen on screen it seems like they kind of want all that stuff to stay as it is and i I don't know how much they want to go back and be like well here's what you saw but here's what actually happened like i I don't know if they want to like make any room for more fan theories or anything like that yeah i i would bet there's going to be one i don't think they're going to do more than that because then it's going to kind of feel like avengers endgame all over again where it's like we're traveling back to these things and look who is actually in the background the whole time so we might get one if I had to bet money. Maybe we see Loki go to Asgard and maybe try and save his mom or something, and then it doesn't work. So I-, I wouldn't be surprised if we see something like that. But I am really curious because, again, we kind of already talked about it because Michael Waldron's working on it. And I don't think it's a surprise that he did Loki and then is jumping over to Doctor Strange, the title being The Multiverse of Madness. This episode in that whole Tara Strong is Miss Minutes video talking about the timekeepers and stuff they mentioned like a multiverse war and what could happen, maybe this series actually ends not well. Maybe something doesn't work out. They can't stop this variant and they create all this crazy stuff that then Doctor Strange and Wanda are going to have to fix in that movie. So I don't know. The next Doctor Strange movie is just easily the most excited I've been for an MCU film probably since Endgame, which I guess is easy to say because that was like our last big one. But like, I am so excited to see what's going to happen in that movie. Yeah, especially after WandaVision, because I'm excited that she's a part of it, so that'll be fun. We also have to remember, Keith, though, I don't know if you know, we might get a little bit more multiverse stuff later this year in December, because, of course, the big rumors are that Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield are actually like going to be in that Spider-Man movie with Tom Holland. Wow. That's freaking <laughs> nuts. <laughs> no, Keith, you said it wrong. It's, Wow. <laughs> Well, and Keith, I don't know if you know, but we're also going to be getting some multiverse stuff in the shit show that is the DCEU, because both uh, Ben Affleck, Christian Bale, and Michael Keaton are going to be in the next Batman movie. Christian Bale? The next Flash movie. (laughs) Ooh, I don't know that. I hope he, like, rests his voice beforehand. We don't want another Dark Knight (laughs) Rises level on our hands. (laughs) I actually don't know if Christian Bale's confirmed. Last I saw, they were talking to him. I I think Michael Michael Keaton already wants out, so... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, they're probably going to replace them both with George Clooney. Ooh, that'd be fun. <laughs> Maybe Owen Wilson should just do it. So, I mean, out of the three MC shows, this one, for me, was by far 
the best opening. I liked how it picks up with the last ever scene from Endgame, and then goes straight into the time variance jail sequence, and which I thought was so hilarious. I mean, all the characters, lines, interactions, and the reactions from Loki with everything that he was running into in there was so funny. I mean, I was hooked right off the bat. Do you guys agree or disagree? I think this one does have the best opening. I think it was kind of always going to have to have the best opening just because of who our main character is in this one. Like Loki is is kind of another level than Wanda and Falcon were, and, and Tom Hiddleston has been such a staple at the MCU for so many years. So only thing I would guess I would kind of just throw out to be devil's advocate is that opening action scene in Falcon did get me really hyped for the rest of that show. So I think in terms of like an opening action scene, I think Falcon really nailed that one. Um, I think I'm with Keith. I think this one is my favorite so far. I like the others. WandaVision, I, I guess my only issue with the other ones was it was kind of a slow start. WandaVision didn't really get into the mystery in that first episode. And Falcon Winter Soldier, like Austin said, great action. But we didn't see Bucky and Sam team up until episode two. So I like that this one, kind of like I mentioned earlier, just really gets into it within a couple minutes. They give us that end game starting point. They give us the quick Gobi Desert thing where he gets captured and then we're off to the races, like Keith said, with all those fun scenes where he has to sign uh, the document of everything he's ever said in his life. He has to walk through a metal detector where he'll die if he's a robot. And he's like, well, what if I'm a robot? But I, d- I don't know. <laughs> um, and all this fun stuff. The guy that didn't take the ticket that dies <laughs> and Loki's like searching <laughs> for his like it was so crazy right off the bat, so I really I really dug the opening for sure. Somebody's got to have a talk with these timekeepers, though. I mean, if, if we're using one sheet of paper for every sentence that somebody's ever uttered, I mean, they're killing a ton of trees in this time realm. We got we got to do something about that. Well, I mean, they could just probably just, you know, revert the time back and just make more trees. or I don't know. They probably See, have some Keith, way that's what I mean. The stakes never feel <laughs> high with time stuff. The low. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing really quick before we move on from this is after this show great opening after this show i do not need to see that 20 total avengers scene ever again in the mcu i'm, I'm kind of sick of yeah. revisiting it at this point it's been a lot it's been a lot we saw it multiple times in this episode <laughs> <laughs> yeah so what do you guys think of the whole timekeeper city yeah did they mention where it is in space and where it like where it lies um i mean yeah it's uh it's in the argon quester uh sector four of the milky way galaxy Oh, okay. He's what do you mean, <laughs> where in space does that. it lie, Keith? <laughs> yeah, he's lying to you, Keith. <laughs> what are they supposed to tell us? We're right next to Pluto? No, Ooh. not that, but like Gardens of Galaxy, they always like say like a name of where they're at and all that whenever they're flying through yeah. space. I would mention, I thought they would mention like where it's at. The The only hint they really gave us was whenever they're in the elevator and it's like, how long have you been here? And then Owen Wilson says, I don't know, time passes differently here. So I'm assuming that this whole city kind of exists outside space and time. It's kind of its own thing, maybe. So, but I have no idea. Yeah. Anyway, now that we know that these timekeepers exist, I mean, how does this affect? We kind of already touched on this, but we can maybe dive a little bit more into it. How does this affect your guys' perspective on all the things that have happened in the movies? Uh, didn't we kind of already get this in Endgame whenever... uh the agents, like Doctor Strange, has to get approval from them to even mess with the Time Stone. Yeah, they they yeah, there was a conversation between the Ancient One and Hulk in a uh, End Game, which is like, I need the stone so I can go back to the future and save the world or whatever. And it's like, no, if you take our Infinity Stone, then it creates branching paths, and then this timeline's fucked. It's like, well, we'll come back and put it back. So they did talk about the whole branching path thing, and then again in this one, it was like when. There's one timeline. It sounds like there was this crazy multiverse war and there was multiple timelines and then the timekeepers created one. So whenever there are branches like Loki surviving, they just get rid of it. So that's the way I understood it. But yeah, there's definitely some end game similarities for sure. What did you guys think about the whole Infinity Stone just being kept in a drawer, being used as paperweights <laughs> by, all, by all the office guys? Do you think they're just like the time variance thing is just kind of downplaying everything too much? I always appreciate that Marvel tries to go for the joke. And I I laughed when I first saw this. I thought it was a great scene and, and a good, you know, just kind of reference. However, the more I think about it, I'm wondering if Marvel may have made a mistake with this scene because I think they just meant it to be a joke. I don't think Infinity Stones are supposed to play a role in this show. But now they have kind of established and it is canon that there are duplicates of the Infinity Stones somewhere out there now. So I, I'm wondering if they made a mistake and if, if now they're like kind of opening themselves up to more and more fan theories and speculation about the future of the Infinity Stones. 
Yeah, because like, don't the Infinity Stones control everything? Are they contradicting themselves with doing that? Yeah, I- I'm kind of with you. I laughed at the scene, but then it obviously caused me to think about it way more than I probably was supposed to. Um, I guess the one thing we can say is, because Owen Wilson's Mobius says it directly, which is like, oh, did you try and use that Tesseract? And he's like, yeah, multiple times. It's like, yeah, it doesn't really work here. So it's not like they're, they are still all powerful. It's just the TVA is one step above them. And normally I would be a little bit annoyed by that, but I think the reason I'm, o- I'm okay with it ultimately is because we are in phase four now. Thanos and the Infinity Saga and all that stuff is behind us, and we know eventually we're going to get another Avengers movie going up against, presumably, an even crazier threat. So for me, the idea of the Infinity Stones not being, I guess, the craziest thing is fine, because I think eventually they're going to want to introduce something crazier than Thanos. So I laughed and I thought about it, and I guess I didn't really want to. I wanted to focus on other things, but I think that's what they were going for. It's like there's crazier and bigger threats out there, maybe. Yeah, and I don't disagree with that. What I'm saying is I think Marvel, too, wants to be done with the Infinity Stones. And I think just by putting this in here, it's like, well, now you have opened yourself up to being like, well, look, we still have them. They're still duplicates. Like, you can still physically get to them if you need to. Um, So I I just wonder if this may have been a mistake. I I love the joke, but if we are truly wanting to move on from this, it it seems like maybe, maybe you think about leaving this out. Yeah, I get that. If you really think about it deep and like metaphorically, we're just going to put them in a drawer for now. Yeah. Uh, so how do you guys feel about the whole reveal that the devil uh, killing the Minutemen is just another evil variant of Loki? I didn't really love this. I don't know how this is supposed to stay interesting since we've already seen evil Loki in phase one. And now we're with mischievous Loki. And then we've also seen good Loki. So are there are we is there now three variants of Loki? Like it, it just seems like it's going to get pretty jumbled to me. I don't think it's Loki. It didn't show his face. I think yeah. they would have shown his face True. if it would have been him. I mean, I, I was really excited when they pointed to that painting and they were like, that's who's killing us. Like, I was like, oh, a new villain. This will be fun. And then when they were like, well, it's you to saying Loki. I was like, ah, that's that's underwhelming for me. But I was like, explain that because it, it's easy to explain the other one. Like he has two versions. So he has the version that he is right there. And then he has the version of him that was killed by Thanos. Explain the third one. Um. Yeah, we'll see. That's a good theory. Um. I don't know. I, I think for me, it's a, it doesn't get too jumbled yet unless they introduce more because for me, the good Loki died. Um, the one that had the character arc is dead. This one, I think it will err towards the side of good, but will still be extremely mischievous and it probably has multiple plans and whatever. And it sounds like the other ones are straight up evil, like the main villain of the show. And then you have kind of mischievous Loki. So for me, it's more that there's two, but again, with how crazy this show could potentially get with timelines and stuff, maybe they're going to throw like a billion Lokis at us. So if they do that, it's going to get a little bit confusing, I think. Were you hoping for a bigger villain when they said there's a devil killing people? I, I mean, I know after WandaVision, people are going to bring up Mephisto again. <laughs> WandaVision's whole thing on Reddit was like, oh, Mephisto, the devil is the one controlling Agatha Harkness. And it's like, no, it was just Agatha <laughs> all along. But <laughs> yeah. uh and then, of course, already on Twitter and Reddit, whenever the little French boy points at this, uh, this like stained glass of a devil, people are like, oh, Mephisto's in this show. It's like, calm, who care? Calm down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I think, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure like another villain out there could have been cool. I'm not familiar with like if Loki has had any specific villains in comics or anything. So I don't know who it could have been. So for now, I'll, I'll just say I'm intrigued for now. I'm not like over the hill, excited about it, but I'm at least interested enough to see how that plays into the storyline going forward. Yeah, I think I'm with you there. I'm still intrigued. I just, I was hoping for a new villain, but that's kind of all I can say. I was just underwhelmed that they were like, it's Loki times three. Mm-hmm. We'll figure it out. We go. We will. Of course, Keith. Of course. Because we're so smart. Well, we won't figure it out. We'll <laughs> just watch it play out on screen and then we'll talk about uh, it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah that's that makes true. sense. <laughs> Speaking of, I guess, watching the rest of this show, we're about to close out here, everybody. But when it came to the timekeepers, of course, they mentioned the whole multiverse needing to die. So I guess that might happen in the show. And then after that, who the hell knows what will happen? But they also, of course, mentioned the madness that we talked about tying into, I think, the Doctor Strange sequel. So just before we close out here, considering how crazy the timeline could potentially get, give me some of your guys' thoughts, theories, or expectations for the rest of the show. Jeez. It's hard to come up with theories when you introduce time. Um, I do think we are going to see at least one Avengers scene that does show us both Loki 
and the time authorities kind of involvement and some of their past actions kind of behind the scenes. I don't think we're going to get more of that. Um, and then I think the end of the show could maybe uh, end up teasing our next kind of big bad, our next Thanos, if you will, for the MCU phase four. I, I think we're kind of getting to that point where we need to start setting that up uh, with all the TV shows we've had and all the movies that are set to come out. So I, I'm going to hold out hope that we get the reveal of, of whoever it is going to be the driving force behind our villains for the MCU phase four. Yeah, that's a good point. And yeah, yeah. So Keith, what do you, what do you got? You have anything specific? I think we might get some sort of backstory on Mobius, Owen Wilson's character. I think, I think mm-hmm. they're going to reveal something about him that we don't, that we're not expecting. I think I could say that. I don't think he's going to be as much of part of the uh, time variance people as we think he is. I think he's going to be playing more of an undercover sort of character. Keith, do you think he will be uh, going undercover as Tony Stark's secretary anytime soon in this show? Oh, I hope so. That would be fantastic. Do you think he wants <laughs> oh, to maybe get in the get in the boxing ring with a sweaty Happy Hogan? Ew. <laughs> Are you talking about Sean Favreau or a dick? <laughs> a sweaty, happy Hogan. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I guess one theory. Let's all let's all go around uh, the horn real quick here. Where do you think Loki ends this season? Like, is he reset? Does he somehow get back to the timeline? Does he work for them? What is your guys' guess on where Loki ends up? Yeah, I think his arc is going to be that at the end of this show, he realizes he still needs to be reset. And he's going to willingly accept that fate, even though knowing that he's headed towards his death at the hands of Thanos. Okay. I was going to say, yeah, he resets, but maybe when he gets to be facing Thanos, he does something a little different. Maybe he survives. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. I think I might go that direction. Of course, I I love for character deaths to mean something, but it just seems like Marvel loves Tom Hiddleston too much. And for good reason. I mean, he's great. So part of me feels like he might have the opportunity to reset and he won't take it and he'll somehow end up in like the modern MCU timeline. Maybe he still works for the TVA, but I feel like he's going to somehow kind of return and maybe will pop up occasionally in movies and TV shows. That's kind of my guess right now. Do we see him in Thor Love and Thunder after this show? If he survives this season, I think yes. I think we might. Wow. Wow. I'll be happy for Chris. I'll be happy for Chris. Good old Chris gets his brother back. All right, everybody. That covers our thoughts on episode one. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and the series, make sure you hit that follow button so you never miss an episode. Podcast subscribers are apparently no longer a thing. I hope everybody downloaded their new Apple update for the new podcast app. We love that app. Also, if you wouldn't mind sharing us with a friend, we'd really appreciate it so that we can continue to grow the show. Please leave us reviews as well. Even if you don't want to write anything, just leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. really does help us out. At The Arnie's is our social, and thearnies.media is the website. We'll be back on Tuesday for the much-anticipated return of our favorite movie series. Keith will, of course, be leading the charge with his pick, Hell or High Water. And yeah, we are excited to be back to this bonus series format. It's been six weeks since we wrapped up The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, so we're happy to be back to some two-show weeks. Uh, Loki uh, this time around will be releasing every Wednesday so our episodes and our reviews will be out each and every week the following Friday Uh, and and stay tuned for another episode of Co-op Couch coming at the end of this month where Matthew and I will be sitting down to discuss all the big gaming news announced at E3 2021 Uh, check us out on Instagram at the Arnie's feel free to direct message us your thoughts on this episode and upcoming episodes Go check out Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It, and Army of the Dead. We just recently reviewed those. And like Matthew said, look forward to Hell or High Water. We'll be breaking it down. All right, everyone. We'll be back soon. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you later. Bye, everybody. Talk to you soon. Wow.